And down the line, we're joined by Mohammed Amin, former chairman of the Conservative Muslim Forum. Good to see you, sir. Uh, let's start with Alicia, who will just set the scene. First of all, remind people why it was that Diane Abbott had the whip removed by the Labour Party in the first place. Yeah, so this goes back a good few months now, quite some time, actually. So this was when Diane Abbott said that Jewish people, Irish people and travellers could not experience racism. She said it wasn't possible for them to experience racism and they, they have never experienced racism. Now, the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, then took the whip away from Diane Abbott. She now sits as an independent MP. Although she has apologised, she has acknowledged that her comments were totally wrong and she, she said that she disassociates herself with them fully. Um, but Keir Starmer has still very much... Um, distance her. Oh, she also said Jewish people, sorry, um, couldn't experience mm -hmm. racism. I think that's the key thing there as well. This is so much because Keir Starmer has been so, so keen to banish anti-Semitism from his party. So he has so far not let her back into the Labour Party. And, and I'll just re refer this to, to Johnny just to see his thoughts on, on, on what Diane Abbott wrote originally in this letter that she penned to the Observer that got the whip taken away from her. Because you would think that um, people have said that she's the MP who has received the most abuse, the most racist bile, you know, who has really been the victim of incredible outpourings of racial hostility. So you'd think she would have had so much time to reflect upon what racism is and what it isn't, and that she wouldn't write a letter to the Observer opining that, uh, that, that, that if you're not black or Asian, I suppose, you can't possibly experience racism. And then say, oh yeah, I'm really sorry, I disassociate myself from what I wrote. There was a very strange letter. I'm trying to, I can't remember the exact wording. Did she say that Jewish people can't experience racism or that they don't experience racism can't the same way racism, as black people? Can't experience racism, but can experience prejudice. Right, I mean, obviously, whatever she said, it was offensive and I said so at the time, obviously, and, you know, when you're talking about the Jewish people's experience in 20th century, it's uh, slightly strange to uh, forget a certain thing that happened uh, to the entire Jewish population of Europe pretty much uh, 80 years ago. But at the same time, I think that we have to be able to distinguish two things. We have to be able to distinguish the, the things that someone has said themselves, which are offensive and wrong. Mm -hmm. And also, it's possible for someone to have made offensive comments and also to have been the victim of the most disgusting racism. Certainly is. Racism. Of course it is. Of course. So, yeah, totally. I kind of, so obviously, you know, Diane Abbott has every right to talk about the racism that she has experienced as a black woman. I think that everyone, everyone agrees with that. Obviously, if we're going to talk about the Observer letter, that was extremely poor taste. And I, I I struggle to understand it even now, Vanessa, because one thing you can say about Diane Abbott is that she's always been quite good, actually, on anti-Semitism, in the sense that she has a very, very large Jewish constituency in Hackney North and Stoke Newington, um, so a lot of uh, Haredi Jews um, living in, in Stamford Hill uh, and so on. So it was doubly surprising, the fact that she seemed to overlook so much the prejudice that that community in particular has suffered. But I, I do think it, I mean, it's a separate point, but I do think it would be appropriate to restore the whip because she suffered a lot and she's apologised and people do get things wrong and they do have the whip restored to them. And if, you know, it's coming up to an election, if she wants to bow gracefully or stand again. I think that she should have the choice to do that. But fundamentally, she does have a point when she says that racism is not a one-party issue and that everyone has to look at the language they use. And I think that that has to be distinguished again from Frank Hester, which is the, the target and that the, 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 should be the main focus mm -hmm. of our conversation right now, because this man is still not having his money returned to him. And we learned today that another £5 million uh, is being sat on by the Conservative Party that he has given, and they just don't want to get rid of it. And they're making every excuse under the sun not to have to get rid of it. Alicia? I think it's just an argument that lots of people are saying for why they wouldn't return that money. And I think it's kind of does have some legs to an extent is it kind of seems like you're rewarding him. Oh, here's your yeah, big here's your money, back. money back yes. as a big thank you. What for, kind of for a punishment is it things. to have your money back? So I guess I guess in that regard, I mean, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you yes, don't really, yes. because there's a there's a big winner in either of these situations. And that is him, to let, be honest. Let's bring Mohammed Amin into this. Mohammed, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've obviously, like everybody else, watched this story unfold. What are your thoughts on uh, Hester and the money and whether he should give it back and whether, whether uh, the Prime Minister should give it back or not? Good afternoon, Vanessa. Rishi Sunak has a very straightforward problem. £10 million is an awful lot of money. A lot of that is money that the Conservatives have already spent. And to the extent that they haven't spent it, they want to spend it in the general election campaign that is coming within the next 12 months. And they don't want to give it back for that reason. Yeah, we know that. We get that they don't want to give it back. The question isn't what, why don't they want to give it back. The question is, should they give it back even though they don't want to? 
in my view, they definitely should. In exactly the same way that when, oh, 20 odd years ago, Tony Blair received a donation from a, uh, in connection with tobacco advertising, and it was so embarrassing that eventually the Labour Party gave it back. Uh, I don't think it's right for the Conservative Party to retain this donation. And yet they have no intention whatsoever of giving it back. And Rishi Sunak's justification for keeping it is that Hester has shown remorse and that he can take remorse and then he can keep the money. He can keep both of them, the remorse and the money, and that's fine. Do you think the remorse cancels out the, uh, the, the things that he said about Diane Abbott or does the remorse not do much for you? Well, let's look at it. If it had been a donation of £50, do we think that Rishi Sunak would be saying, we, let's not give it back, the remorse is OK? I think that it's simply because it's a larger amount of money and he doesn't want to give it back. Therefore, he's more willing to say Frank Hester has shown remorse. OK, you're the former chairman of the Conservative Muslim Forum. As a Conservative Muslim, I assume you're still a Conservative Muslim. You can tell me if you're not. But if you are... How do you feel about being loyal to the party if, uh, if the Prime Minister insists that he must really retain this £10 million gift and might be sitting on another £5 million from the same fella? Well, first of all, I resigned from the Conservative Party the day that Mr Johnson became the Conservative Party leader. I was then partyless for about five or six months. And then when the general election campaign of 2019 began, I joined the Liberal Democrat Party and I'm a grassroots member of the Liberal Democrats. But that is not why I'm saying you should give it back. I would be saying exactly the same thing if it was money that the Liberal Democrats had received in, this, in these situations. And what do you make of the, of the um, speaker not calling upon Diane Abbott to speak in a debate that largely centred on what had been said and done to her, and when she tried 40 times, she says, to speak and to participate in the conversation. What do you think of that? I think Lindsay Hoyle's problem as Speaker right now is that he feels insecure about his position, having deviated from normal practice a few weeks ago, doing something that he had the authority to do, but it's not wasn't normal practice when he allowed Labour to propose an amendment to the SNP's resolution. I think he feels reluctant to deviate from normal practice yesterday by letting Diane Abbott speak, although from time to time the Speaker does allow people to speak who are not on the order paper. And in my view, it would have been the right thing for him to do to let her speak. But I think his concerns about having deviated once and being in trouble for it meant that he was more reluctant to deviate yesterday. All right, Johnny. I think that we have to tie this conversation in as well, Vanessa, to uh, a rather ill-timed intervention by Michael Gove about the definition of extremism. Well, we've discussed that already because, on the show, but because yes, it is, Because do. it is very difficult for the government to hold this line that it's going to start clamping down on organisations such as the Muslim Council of Great Britain, which is seen as the voice of, of moderate Islam in this country, and at the same time not to be able to call uh, a, a, an appeal to a shoot or a desire to shoot a black woman to say that you hate all black women as extremists. You can't have it both ways. So the government is going to have to get off this um, uncomfortable fence it's sitting on eventually, and the result of that will either be uh, that it um, gives back the money um, or that it um, doesn't give back the money uh, and uh, pretends that extremism doesn't actually exist when it does. What, what do they mean, Alyssa, when they talk about weaponizing racism or politicising racism or Diane Abbott accuses the Conservative Party of playing the race card? In what way are they doing it? What does she mean and what does all of it mean? I think yesterday's prime... Prime Minister, yesterday, are we on Thursday? Thursday Gosh, today. I'm losing yeah. track. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday's Prime Minister's questions was a perfect example of that. We basically had the leader of the Labour Party and the Prime Minister effectively mudslinging at each other and saying, no, you're more racist, no, you're more racist. And it was really quite horrific mm -hmm. to watch, really. This is two very important people who are meant to be really setting an example and leading the country using... Uh, examples of other people's alleged racism and racist comments to kind of use as insults to the other party. And I think things like that, it's when, it's when 
the government and when senior political figures use it as a kind of political standpoint, something to weaponize against the other party and say, well, you've had this, this and this, therefore you're this. And therefore that means that we are the better party. I think it's that. And we've seen it a lot more recently with the heightened and more tense element of what's happening in the Middle East. And I think that has definitely become a bit of a political point that both the parties are trying to use for their own political gain and advancement. And I think the public see through it. Mohammed, what do you think of Michael Gove's attempts to redefine what extremism is? Extremism is a serious issue in our society. And I think it is important to have a definition of extremism, but it needs to be a definition that is widely agreed and accepted. The definition that's been in the prevent program since 2011 is reasonably accepted i think it's worked okay if michael gove wants a new definition i think the right thing to do is to try to get cross-party agreement and agreement with civil society on a definition you'd expect somebody to publish a draft definition and then consult on it and instead he's done none of these things he's come up with his own definition, the government's going to apply it regardless of what anybody else thinks. And that's not the way to achieve consensus. On the other hand, you know, these are difficult times. These are times when, you know, you read on the front page of The Telegraph that the uh, Jewish community of London feels that its own city of London is a no-go zone every other weekend since October the 7th. You hear about enormous increases in Islamophobic incidents, in anti-Semitic incidents. This is a, an extreme situation, you might say, that calls for uh, urgent action rather than a lengthy consultation which ends up in nothing much except something nebulous. And actually, uh, Michael Gove's definition of extremism, the promotion or advancement of violence, hatred or intolerance or any organisation that does that, doesn't that sit perfectly comfortably with you? Don't you think that's a jolly good, clear, brief, excellent definition of what extremism is? Well, unfortunately, it's a little bit too elastic. It talks about based on violence, hatred and or intolerance. Intolerance in particular is an extremely elastic word. You need to get consensus. It doesn't have to take a long time. You could get the Board of Deputies of British Jews, the Muslim Council of Britain, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrat Party, the Conservative Party round a table and agree something. Why but is instead... intolerance a particularly, as you like to describe it, elastic word? You mean it's not clear? You mean the definition of what intolerance means is not clear to you or won't be clear to others? What's wrong with it? Uh, what's wrong with it yeah. is that it, it gets widely used against people who are saying perfectly reasonable things. We've seen that with the trans debate and with women who believe that their biological sex is a real and important thing, and they get accused of intolerance. Well, I'm not sure it's as simple as, as that, and I'm not sure that the word intolerance is the reason for that kind of conflict, but we'll, we'll see. Do, do, what do you think of Michael Gove's uh, definition, the promotion or advancement of violence, hatred or intolerance, Jonathan? I think that... I think that we have laws to deal with this already. This is the point. Do we need extra definitions? Do we need uh, a, a sort of a wider net to catch people? What I want to see the evidence about who is falling short of the definition that needs to be criminalised or needs to be prescribed in some way. That evidence hasn't been provided. And actually, I agree uh, with Mohammed uh, on, on the intolerance point. I don't know what his position on trans rights is. And it actually doesn't matter what you think about trans rights, because I don't think, uh, I think that it's perfectly legitimate to have one view or another, but uh, you could easily brand your opposing side intolerant, intolerant of women, intolerant of trans people or whatever. And I think that would be quite wrong to try and shut down debate. I think actually the right and the left could find some common ground on this because we do need to have, to get that balance right between free speech and actually clamping down on genuine extremism, which let's not forget is about protecting people. It doesn't protect people to clamp down on free speech. Thank you all very much indeed.